Oh, well, I think I'll cut my 100-page sermon down to a couple this morning. I think it's gone a bit longer than we expected. But no, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, Jedediah and Lisa and Robert, too, for leading our, our young people in the capacity that you have this year. That's absolutely awesome. But I think, too, we can say thank you to the church because we are the ones, too, who are uh, to, to guide and, and look after our young people as they come, come through the ranks. So we praise, the, praise God uh, for giving us the time to be his servants and for the time that you guys have invested uh, in, in our young people, we just say a big thank you this morning. Just uh, could we could just bow our head one more time before I open God's word this morning. Father, we just want to say thank you that you have given us your word, the Bible, Lord. You have given us the word, your son, Jesus Christ, and we praise you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the counsel and for the wisdom that comes from your word, Lord, because day by day it leads us and it guides us. Help us always to take hold of these promises, Lord, in order that we are strengthened and encouraged from day to day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. just like to read um, a scripture before I actually go into our our main uh, discussion or sermon today. And it's taken from the book of uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, where it says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you yet nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as nurses, nurse cherisheth her children. So being, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you are dear to us. That has been our service to the Dargaville Church. As of November next year, or February next year, you'll have a new pastor. Pastor John Smolker will be moving up from Gisborne to take over here. And Marianne and I are going to have a sabbatical, a bit of time off. She says, I don't hold her hand enough. So um, I'll try and do that the best I can next year. But uh, it's a big thank you to each and every one of you um, for your support, your prayers. And it's been our greatest pleasure to serve this congregation. And uh, it's, I just want to also say thank you for the trust that you put in me as your pastor to share your issues and, uh, and prayers and, and, your, and your anxiety. But it's great to see that you love Jesus as I do. Amen. So on that note, I'm going to just share a testimony with you this morning because as we sang that song, Face to Face with Jesus, this is how close Jesus wants to be with us. Amen. Amen. Many of you know Auntie Jane Berridge that used to fellowship here. A couple of Sabbaths ago, I was uh, fellowshipping in Kaikoui, and she says to me, do you know that my niece, Ruth, is not well? And I said, no, I didn't. What's wrong? She's got cancer too. And I said, oh, sorry to hear that. Now, Ruth, Ruth is, a, is a special lady also because when I did her mother's funeral in Kaitaia about five or six years ago, um, it was then that the word of God changed her life and she then recommitted to Christ and also got married, right? So she, she holds a special place in our lives too. So I said, where is she? And she said, uh, she's in Whangarei. So I said, okay, great. So I rang her brother, George, and I said, George, is it possible for us to meet with your sister? And he said, I'll organise it. I said, well, tomorrow will be great. He said, okay. So that morning I was busy. He rings me up and says, um, are you still coming? I said, yeah, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Oh, really? Really? So we jump in his car and we go up to the, his sister's address, and as we get to the gate, there's these three big bulldogs. Arr! And they did not like our, our parents, you know? They were just growling, and I went, oh, George, please go first. You know, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too young to die. <laughs> as, as we then get up on the balcony, the, the ranch lighter goes open, and his niece says to him, oh, uncle, it's not a good idea to come today. He says, um, she says, my your nephew, my brother, he's absolutely furious. He, he's, he's got a hate for you. That's something enormous. I don't think it's good today. He then turns to me and he says, what do you reckon, Pastor? And I said, we've come in the name of the Lord. We're going in. She says, oh, wait a minute. She disappears behind the curtain, comes back a short time later and said, it's okay. So we went in and I saw this young chap standing there. I said, g'day, bro. How you doing? All right? He says, yes, thank you. 
walked into the bedroom to greet George's sister and, and asked how she was. She says, I'm fine. I'm fine. And then as we were discussing it, George says to her, would you like an anointing, sis? And she said, yeah, I'd love that. And I'm like, oh, no, I've got to go back out to the car. Her husband obviously read my mind and said, I'll come with you, Pastor. Um, and he did, but those dogs were still, Arr! and he said, I'll be quiet. And they're still growling. And so as I got the oil from the car, I explained to him what we were about to do, because he's not a Seventh-day Adventist believer, um, as his wife is. So he says, I said, are you okay with that? And he said, look, whatever mum wants, I'm fine with that. I said, okay, all right. So we go back into the house, and then um, I, uh, I said, well, I'm going to explain to you from Scripture why, what we're about to do. So George opened with a beautiful prayer as we're kneeling beside his, his, um, his sister's bed. And he said, yep, no, I'm, I'm okay with that. And then I said, well, you just kneel there. George is there, and we laid our hands on his sister, and we did the anointing. After I prayed... The tears were just streaming down her face. And I thought, well, how beautiful is that? That the Spirit of God had touched that, that lady, right? As we go there, I said, well, we're out of here now. We're going to leave you in the hands of the Holy Spirit to heal. We're out of here. So as we leave, I'm going past the kitchen. The young man's still standing there. I went over and shook his hand and said, all the best. Uh, um, take care. He said, thank you. As his uncle walks out behind me, he says, love you, uncle. And I'm going, did you hear that? He says, and, and George says, yeah, I, I do too, bro. He says, no, love, uh, Uncle, I really love you. So as we're putting our shoes on the door, George looks back and he says, I'll, I'll ring you later. I love you too, son. But here's the other part of the miracle. Go outside, the dogs are asleep. <laughs> They're asleep. As, we, as I walked past them with George, they just looked up and went back to sleep. The power of the Holy Spirit had come upon that house in such a way that there was peace over that home as i'm driving home with george he says all we need pastor is faith and i said yeah i know jesus even gives us a head up and he says even if you have the faith of a mustard seed that will suffice <laughs> brothers and sisters we serve an awesome god amen? amen and he is so close so close he just wanted it to be so close that that day as he as he allowed us to be used to do that service. Amen? And for, ever, for everyone that's been anointed here in our church, it's ongoing. God has got you. Don't worry about it. Claim that faith and, uh, and you will be okay. And if anyone who would like an anointing, uh, you know, please, please let me know. God is awesome. We celebrate in those victories. We celebrate in sharing that testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen? We serve an awesome God. I'd like us now just to go to the book of Judges, and, and I haven't actually spoken about this topic for a long time, but it's one of my favourites in the sense that I think that um, it kind of um, relates to me, because it's about, you want an idea? Judges chapter 13, it's about Samson, right? Samson, the strongest man who ever lived on earth, and because both Les and I have been into weight training and stuff, that's, a, that's an area uh, where we, we uh, are quite feel at home with. But I'd like us just to read here in the first, uh, first um, couple of verses of chapter 13 in the book of Judge, Judges. And it says in verse 1, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. 40 years. Can you imagine that? Isn't it amazing how God, when he's preparing his people or put, casts judgment upon his people, it's a period of, of 40 years. That whole 40-year number in Scripture is talking about a preparation time, right? Jesus was in the desert how long? 40 days, 40 nights, right? Okay, in preparation for his ministry. And here we have that same account here where the, Phil where the Israelites have been delivered into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. And it's amazing, in that period of 40 years, did they come closer to God? No, they started to adapt to the, to the culture and the society of the Philistines just like they did in the time when they were in captive in Egypt before they became, became uh, Israel. Then it says there was a certain man named of Zorah of the family of the Danites of the tribe of, the, of Dan whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and bore not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, 
Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Familiar story. Again, it's amazing how when God has got someone special he wants to raise up, he uses a barren uh, lady, right? Um, and he said, it's okay, uh, I'm going to open your womb so that you will bear a son. Now therefore, beware, I pray thee, in verse 4, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat nothing that is un any unclean thing. And eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the Lord, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the land of the Philistines. What was that key word in there? He shall deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. That's his purpose. But for him to do that, there's a preparation time. From the womb, he's not allowed to eat this, he's not allowed to drink that, right? In other words, I want him to be conscious of everything that he's about to do for me, right? Not allowed to drink wine, I want his blood to be pure, I want everything to be good with this man, right? And, uh, um, and of course, the sign of the Naz to be a Nazarite is to, not, is to let your hair grow, right? And... Um, so it's not because he comes from Nazareth, it's because it's the, it's the order of the Nazarite. Okay? When, you, when you see that area where they were living, it's, um, it's uh, not even anywhere near um, Nazareth. When the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither he told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive, bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So then what happens is in the next part of our story is then that angel, then Manoah, her husband, then prays that this angel will come back, right? He comes back and he confirms exactly the same thing he said to his wife the first time. It's, it's interesting that her name is not mentioned here, but when you go back and study some of the manuscript, her name comes up as Hazil El Pony, mother of Solomon. It's interesting that it wasn't mentioned here in scripture, but uh, old manuscripts have, have um, designated her or uh, given her that name. God had important work for the promised child of Manoah to do, and it was to secure him for the qualifications necessary for this work. You know, it's just like God has called us uh, to be his children, and he's also preparing us to do a work. Amen? And as we had our last week in our Sabbath school, there is really no other book to read. It's this one. Because in here we have everything we need for our lives, from our clothing, our diet, our conduct, and, uh, and our relationship to one another. The beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book is, is the Bible, eh? Neither let her drink wine nor strong drink was the angel's instruction for the wife of Manoah, nor eat any unclean thing that all that I command her, let her observe. This is from the spirit of prophecy where it says the child will be affected for good or evil by the habits of the mother. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing counsel. She must herself be controlled by principle and must practice temperance and self-denial if she would seek the welfare of her child. In the New Testament, we find a no less impressive example of the importance of temperance, and we see that in the life of John the Baptist. Amen? His mother Elizabeth was given the same counsel on what he should eat and drink, right? And what a great man he turned out to be, because Jesus himself said there was no other better than John the Baptist, right? He did a great work in preparing people for the coming deliverer of Israel. But you know... Unfortunately, unfortunately, history repeats itself all through Scripture where these people keep going back and going away from God. But brothers and sisters, as spiritual Israel, we cannot afford to go anywhere else but forward with God because time is short. And as I said to one of the pastors this week, I said, you know, um, Pastor, I said, we have to change our sentence. Jesus is not coming soon. He's coming. Amen? Amen. Because when we, as soon as we put that soon on there, it kind of gives us a bit of delay. Oh, well, maybe I can do this before he comes, right? Because he is coming soon, but no, he's coming. So we cannot, we cannot afford to ignore what Scripture is telling us about how they acted in the past 
because we need to learn from it. Because as, as uh, Sol- Samson was raised up to be a deliverer of Israel, Jesus Christ was raised up to be our deliverer, right? Oh, we're, we're, an, awesome, we're an awesome people. So John the Baptist was a reformer. To him was committed a great work for the people of his time, and in preparation for that work, all his habits were carefully regulated even from his birth. John also separated himself uh, from his friends and from the luxuries of life dwelling alone in the wilderness and subsisting upon a purely vegetable diet. The simplicity of his dress, a garment woven of camel's hair, was a rebuke to the extravagance and display of the people of his generation, especially to the Jewish priest. His diet, also of locusts and wild honey, was a rebuke for the glut- to the gluttony that everywhere prevailed. Powerful counsel, isn't it? But that's why God has raised us up to be his people, to be a witness to the world. Amen. The divine promise to Manoah was in due time fulfilled in the birth of Samson. As the boy grew, it became evident that he possessed extraordinary physical strength. He was the strongest man that was ever upon planet Earth. His strength was not, as Samson and his parents well knew, dependent upon his well-knit sinews, but upon his condition as a Nazarite, of which his unshorn hair was a symbol. Had Samson, had Samson obeyed the divine commands, his would have been a nobler and happier destiny. But association with idolaters corrupted him completely. The town of Zora being near the country of the Philistines, Samson came to mingle with them on friendly terms. A young woman dwelling in the Philistine town of Timnah engaged Samson's affections and he determined to make her his wife. To his God-fearing parents who endeavoured to dissuade him from his purpose, his only answer was, she pleases me, at last the marriage took place. So this place, Timnah, is only 30 k's north of Eilat, down by the Red Sea on the border to, to Egypt, right? And it's a very, very hot, rugged place. They've got um, a tin mine there, copper mine there also. And it's, uh, we've been through that area and it's just dry, dry and barren. So as we go through the story, and I'm not going to you know, stop on every point, but just to, to, um, to indicate how Samson was called by God and how he left God, right? So here he is, he sees this woman and he wants her. He kind of spits the dummy with his parents. He says, she pleases me, I want her. The story goes on to say that as that marriage was about to take place, for some reason he, he stepped back from it, right? But then on the next occasion he wants to go back to this, to this woman, right? And her father said, I'm sorry, I thought you didn't love her anymore, so I gave her to your groomsman. But her sister is available. So can you see the similarities that are taking place in our world today? You know, they're not moral. There's no... There's no uh, principles there, Christian principles involved here, right? Oh, well, if she's no good, we'll go to the next one. No, that's not what God's saying, right? But Samson did love that lady, and he got angry. So what does he go and do? The story tells us that he went and caught 300 foxes. Well, don't know how he did that. But he, uh, certainly God must have been on his side. And then he tied their, a pair, their tails together, Lit a, lit a fuse and let them go through the wheat fields and the olive fields of the Philistines and ex- absolutely destroyed their, their, um, their plantations from what they were about to eat, right? Again, they then became angry and retaliated and said, we want to we wanna kill this guy. We want to kill this guy, right? But what they did, the Philistines, they went and burnt the lady he was going to marry and her father, and that's why he retaliated with the foxes again, right? But then he finds a jawbone and goes back as they come to, as they come to get Samson out of the cave that he was hiding in. And the thing that is sad about this story, and please read the story afterwards, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the whole of Judah came to help the Philistines capture their deliverer. How crazy is that? Right? He then, he then goes and destroys a thousand of the Philistines with a jawbone, it goes on to say, right? Amazing, amazing. So we think this world's pretty bad, but it may have started off pretty bad too, 
right? But this is just the result of sin in people's lives when we're not listening to what God is telling us, unfortunately. However, we know the story that um, it goes on, that after all this took place, they tied him, he broke, he broke the, the, uh, the ropes that they tied him with because his strength was absolutely phenomenal, right? He just busted everything apart uh, when they tried to capture him. But here, as we pick up the story in chapter 16 and verse 4, it came and it says, chapter 16 of Judges and verse 4, and it says, And it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Right? We know the story of Samson and Delilah, but the story, the name Delilah means to consume. Right? So her sole purpose from her name was be to, to destroy uh, to d- destroy uh, the people she comes into contact with. However, the lords of the Philistines, verse 5, came unto her and said unto her, Entice him and, set, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by, by what means he may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver if you do that. Well, that's more than a year's wages they wanted to give her to capture this man. He'd done so much damage to the Philistines, they wanted him out of, the, out of there, right? So as the story goes on, she tries to find out where, where his strength lies. Samson lies to her three times. And then she, then she says, you don't love me anymore. You're not telling me the truth. And she, pla- she plagued at him and plagued him and said, come on, tell me, tell me, to the extent that he said, okay. He said, a razor has never come upon my head. So that night as he slept, she arranged for the Philistines to come and to cut his hair, right? And they did. And I just want to pick up up that story here because this is um, amazing. Um, Where it says, Then he suddenly uttered a prayer, O Lord God... Oh no, sorry, I'm I'm, I'm a bit ahead of myself there too. So anyway, they've cut their hair, then she she gets... um, gets the Philistines to come and to capture him, right? Oh, here it is, sorry, in verse 19 of uh, chapter 16. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and did grind in the prison house. Sad, isn't it? Sad. When we don't uphold our loyalty to God, these things can happen. These things can happen. And, you know, we just um, came in contact with a family that had been saddened by an attack on that family, which was, you know, uh, an untruth told, but the suffering and the pain that that people were going through. We're going to go through persecution, brothers and sisters. Some of us might be experiencing it now ourselves and that our families are rejecting us because we are standing up for the Holy Sabbath day, right? We've had it in our own family. But praise God, there's been healing that's taken place when they see that we are loyal to our God and Saviour. And there's no difference. We're all in the same boat here. Amen? Different circumstances, different consequences. But God wants us to be loyal. So here, as we have it, when Samson realized that his strength, that his hair had been shaved, his strength had gone, that the Lord had le- left him, or right, departed from him. The Lord wanted him to be faithful all the way through to be the deliverer of Israel. And here he, here he, here he does the worst thing he could do and that he broke one of the main vows that God had asked him not to do, to cut his hair. And of course then he was weak and he was able to be captured. How dark and terrible the record of that life which might have been a praise to God and a glory to the nation had Samson been true to his divine divine calling, the purpose of God could have been accomplished but he yielded to temptation and his mission was fulfilled in bondage and in death so we go over over the page here and uh, 
And um, sorry, uh, your, your Bible might be different, but let's go to uh, verse um, 26. So, in the, so what they did, they took out, out his eyes, right? And he continued to serve them as a laborer, um, grinding wheat and, and working for them, eating uh, you know, a, a very minimal diet. So it's sad to see that this great man of God ended up, um, in verse 21, I can, we can read that too, but the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. Samson, being blind, of course, said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and upon which it was borne up, of the one which was his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren and all the house of his fathers came down, took him up, brought him up, and buried him between Zora and Eshtel in their burying place of Manoah his father. And he judged Israel twenty years. An amazing story, an amazing story. God had a purpose for Samson, just as he's got a purpose for each and every one of us, right? Samson was to be the physical um, deliverer of Israel, and they refused him. They never even helped him to, um, to overcome the Philistines. Instead, they joined forces uh, with them. But in his final act, in his final act of sacrifice... He slew the Philistines and allowed Israel to be free again. Jesus has also paid a huge price for each and every one of us in order that we too will not be under bondage and work the work of Satan. He wants us to be free and to work and to do his work here on earth to bring salvation uh, to all those who are in darkness. Spirit of Prophecy goes on and says, How dark and terrible the record of that life, which might have been a praise to God and a glory to that nation. Physically, Samson was the strongest man upon earth, but in self-control, integrity and firmness, he was one of the weakest. He who is mastered by his passions is a weak man. Real greatness is measured by the power of the feelings that a man controls, not by those that control him. Those who are in the way of duty are brought into trial may be sure that God will preserve them. Amen? Another beautiful promise that we have to hold on to, brothers and sisters. But if men willfully place themselves under the power of temptation, they will fall. And they do, unfortunately. Satan attacks us at our weak points, working through defects in the character to gain control of the whole man. He knows that if these defects are cherished, he will succeed. Brothers and sisters, please stay in the word. Satan will leave us alone if we stay in the word. He can't touch us when we're in the light of Christ. But none need be overcome. Help will be given to every soul who really desires it. Angels of God that descend and descended the ladder which Jacob saw in vision will help every soul who will to climb even to the highest heaven. And that's what we need to do, brothers and sisters. As children of, of, uh, of God, we need to, um, to 
not be humble church mice and thinking, yeah, that's the piety that we have to take upon us. No, we are children of God and he's given us power to do the work he's asked us to do, as I shared in, uh, in the testimony before. God gifted Samson with incredible strength, but he often abused it, using the might to show off rather than bring glory to God. He learned the hard way that the Lord can give and take away gifts in a moment's notice. God has given us all spiritual gifts in order that we can edify his church, his body. Amen? Samson didn't, didn't see the immediate payout for some of his sin until much later, but it tends to catch up, catch us at the worst moments. When we feel like acting on impulse like he had, we need to remind ourselves of the truth of scriptures. We will encounter many Delilahs in this world who will try to find our greatest weakness and exploit it. Amen? So brothers and sisters, you know, we need to be conscious of every activity we undertake in life, right? Guard, guard your time, guard yourselves. Derived of all strength and humiliated beyond measure, God returns Samson his strength for one last showdown. Although Samson dies in the process, he ends up killing more of Israel's enemies than he had ever done during his boastful, revengeful days. Satan is trying to kill as many as he can out there. And we need to be strong in our, in our love for people that we don't want to see anyone destroyed by the evil one. Amen? Let us be strong. Psalm chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. Psalm chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. where it simply says here, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen. This is where we put our strength. Psalm 70, verse uh, 5. Psalm 70, verse 5 says, But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my helper and my deliverer. O Lord, make no Tarrying. And then in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 35, our last verse for this morning. Acts chapter 7 and verse 35. This Moses whom you ref who they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angels which appeared to him in the bush. So again, Moses was also called to be a deliverer of the people of Israel. All the way through Scripture, we have these beautiful examples of men that God and ladies that God had raised up to bring their attention back to God the Creator, God the Redeemer, Saviour and soon coming King. Amen. Amen. And God did not think it unnecessary not to send the greatest deliverer, Jesus Christ. You know, and as this time in the world where people tr hopefully remember that Jesus was born, that they too will contemplate why is the story of Jesus so well known around the Western world? And it's because he is the only answer for today's dying world. So may we be encouraged to help spread this message with more, with more rapidity than maybe what we have. With love and compassion for those who we love. May God bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.